Good evening. I'm Ariana Cohen Halberstam. I am the artistic director of Boston Jewish Film. Welcome to our 32nd annual festival, our first ever virtual film festival, and to the Where Do We Go From Here Shorts Film Program Q&A. Thank you to our community partner on this program, Temple Aliyah in Needham. And I'm so pleased to have with us today some of the filmmakers of the films that you saw in this program. Omer Ben Shachar, the director of Tree Number no. Three, Jen Kaplan, the director of A Father's Kaddish, and Steve Bronfman, the subject of the film, Randy Cicchini and Miriam Lewin, the filmmakers from Commandment 613, and Daniela Bokar, who's about to join us, and Liana Berkovich, the filmmakers of Fata Morgana. Thank you all for being with us here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. So, I, I programmed all these films together because I think that there's related themes, um, but in some ways these are all very, very different films. I mean, I think what I found um, in common of all these films is that they're all dealing with moving on, next steps, how people are um, moving into next chapters of their lives or taking something and bringing it into the future. Um, so. We can talk more about those later, but I just wanted to underline how they're all connected um, and how they all work together. But the films are all very different. And I'm interested um, in how each of you came to make these films. And, and I'll start with you, Jen. Um, how did you meet Steve? And um, did you know about his project when you first met him? Did you know about um, his relationship with Fathers Forever? What was your entry point to this story? Yeah, thank you. Um, I actually met Steve uh, through Rabbi Carl Perkins from Temple Aliyah in Needham. And I just had come back from a trip from Israel. And uh, Rabbi Perkins called me on the phone and said, Jen, you have to see this exhibit. Not only do you have to see it, but I really think you should film it. So I called Steve on the phone and said, Rabbi Perkins introduced, you know, mentioned you. And so I had no knowledge of anything about this exhibit, about his experience or anything else. And I called Steve and he was about to finish the exhibition in about two or three days. And I called him, I was able to get a cinematographer. We came down, met him. Um, it was just incredible, incredibly moving experience. And, um, and then after I finished filming for the day, I said, Steve, this has got to be a film. Like we just sort of, sort of planned to do a one-off. And when, I, when we finished, um, I said, we've got to make something of this. So that's how it all started five years ago. And Steve, when you when you first met Jen and she approached you about um, making this into a film, were, I, I imagine that it's not every day that you bring a camera into a Potter's studio where you, or into um, your father's forever meetings, which which feel like very intimate gatherings. Um, did it? Did you take some convincing, or or did you see the film happening immediately as well? It, it was uh, it was just organic the way it happened. Um, th there was there was almost no decision to be made when Jen first when Jen came to the gallery. I mean, literally, the, the show was coming down the next day, and the circumstances that coalesced in order for this to happen were just an extraordinary uh, connection of circumstances that. If any one of them didn't work out, then we wouldn't, I wouldn't be here, Jen and I wouldn't be here with you today for this. So when she came to sit to the gallery, when she and Nikki, her videographer, um, stood at the entrance to the gallery and just stood there and, and couldn't even walk in because they were so um, just taken with what they were looking at, um, we, just, we met through tears. I mean, that's basically how we met. We met through tears and it just, it just happened from there. It's, it's interesting because you, you end the film. I mean, we see the exhibit towards the end of the film. And of course, it sounds like that's actually the, the genesis and the beginning of this whole project. Yeah. The magic of filmmaking too. Yeah, um, yeah. Welcome, Daniela. I know you had some technical issues, so I'm glad you were able to join us. Um, and I, I wanted to Thanks. ask you, <laughs> I, I wanted to ask you and Liana, um, I imagine I, I, it's not every day that you meet women like Rachel, Anna, and Christina. Um, how did you meet them? And, and how did you know there was a film there? 
Uh, so we meet them uh, in different ways. Uh, Christina was couch surfing uh, at my place. And Anna and Rachel, Rachel, uh, we both, uh, they both uh, kind of, uh, we asked people like if they know uh, nomads that they are mothers and um, nomads that they are like women that they are um, older and after we met some kind of uh, it was a friend of a friend uh, that he's uh, uh, traveling all over the world so uh, he he gave us uh, their numbers and we called them and meet up. So you started with the idea of creating a film about women who are nomads. Right. With something like uh, 15 girls, I think, uh, maybe more, uh, with a lot of different backgrounds from uh, really strange Facebook pages. Uh, we got uh, names by rumors. It was some kind of uh, very, very long research uh, about only this part. And we met women in a lot of different ages. A few of them were uh, uh, 16 years old. A few of them were older. And uh, the hardest things for us was actually to find a mother that we were participating, a mother to a child which is not, not a grown up yet. And uh, yeah, so we spoke with a lot of women, but those three were we thought representing the best way of the story we wanted to tell in, in Fata Morgana specifically. It's definitely a story I, I had not seen many times and the three women all worked really nicely together to show these different aspects of it. Um, and um, so, so it sounds like you, you were looking for women from different, different parts of their lives to represent this right. story. Right, um, right, exactly. And and Miriam and Randy, how, how did you, I, I, I know that Miriam, you've known Kevin for many years. When did you sort of see it, see the film there um, and realize that, you know, th this was a story to, to tell? Uh, I was, um, I had always made films for hire and I was at a point where I was open to making a film that would be passion project, which is actually something I'd always sworn not to do. And when Kevin told me about the work he was doing with the scrolls from the Memorial Scrolls Trust, I just said, that sounds like a film. And Randy and I had worked on a couple of projects for hire before, and we were interested in doing something uh, that would expand our friendship and our, our filmmaking. And that's how it Um, Omer, your film is the only fiction film here, um, and but it still feels it feels personal in a way. It feels like you know this character well. Um, how did how did you come up with this character and and create this story? Is it based on something in your own life? Um, yes, it is. So I know it's fun that all all the movies are documentaries and. Uh, the subjects are coming through and I'm just speaking about this uh, imaginary thing, but it's de it was definitely based on real life experience. So I uh, grew up in Texas. We moved to Texas when I was when I was young as, as a as a kid and I had, you know, this very strong Israeli accent, but I had I had dreamt of being in the school play of getting these big parts in the school play and I was told that until I improve my accent I cannot get a role and when I did it was a background role so that's really where tree number three uh came from the idea came from but but it, it wasn't only it wasn't we didn't want to make a movie that was like a bummer you know because it could be a, a tragedy too about this kid who wants to lead in his background because of his accent but the thing I remembered uh was these plays that I would put in, in my living room home where I invited my grandmother and anybody who came to visit from Israel and friends. And there I basically cast myself in all the roles. Um, and yeah, and, and that's really the message that we wanted to show in the movie is, you know, you can cast yourself as the, as the lead. 
That's a, it's a beautiful message and it's such an interesting one to think about um, in the context of these documentaries that are all about individuals. Um, this, where, where people have become the lead, maybe, you know, we're all the leads in our own stories, but they've actually become the leads in these, in these films. I think one of the things that, um, that resonates in your film now as well, just being that we're so distant and, you know, I'm doing this with you over a computer screen now is these scenes with the grandmother um, where he's connecting with her at this distance. Um, and obviously I imagine that's not how you spoke to your family when you were in Texas, though you're younger than I am, so maybe you did, but you know, speaking over video um, is, is definitely a cinematic choice. Can you talk about how you, um, how you created the grandmother character, how you decided to have her sort of come alive through the screen? That's so interesting, you know, cause I think you're right. And it was like 2004, there was, was there, but there was Skype. I think there was Skype because to be honest, that decision was like felt very, organic and we didn't like think it twice you know it was like oh yeah he's speaking on Skype with his grandmother and I guess now it's like a more common thing but the grandmother is very much based on my grandmother here in Israel who's a author here and a children's book author and she had very high hopes for me and I really like the worst thing I could do was tell her well in my eyes the worst thing I could do was tell her I was background you know really when I told her <laughs> she was excited that it was a tree and that it was colorful and you know she she found ways to make it sound more tempting but i think yeah for me i really was scared of, of telling her and i i didn't lie that i got i told her i got a background but then i put on like this this production at home to kind of impress her and make her proud i guess but yeah it's it the film, I mean, I, the film has made everybody that I've spoken to cry, and I, and I think performing not just for the grandmother, but you see him sort of come in into himself. Um, and craft sort of plays a role in different ways. You also made these incredible sets for your. Um, did you? What was the process of making these these school sets for the for the tree and? Yeah, the they're, school they're sets adorable. are like sets within a set, right? Like they're actually, I think, easier than doing the real sets of the bedroom or, you know, because because the sets can just look like, you know, school play sets, uh, which was the fun thing. But that was a lot of it was the production designer. Her name was, her name is Katya. She studied with me at AFI. So this was a school thesis film and an AFI thesis film. And yeah, Katya was amazing. I mean, the production designers at AFI are like, so impressive they really the craft is a good word like their craft is just so good you know and you say like oh we want like a moon in the background so the Katya showed me like 200 moons who knew there was like 200 moons you can choose from you know and like 200 kinds of grays and that was all Katya but very fun to to do yeah production design is fun I Maybe I should be a production designer. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I have to think about that transition. Well, speaking of craft, I mean, both both Mir Miriam and Randy's film and Jen's film um, talk about uh, craft. And then, of course, there's there's a lot of craft in, in Liana and Daniela's film. Um, I want to talk about that across the films. And and Steve, of course, that's, that's what you do. Um, Let's start with talking to Jen and Steve a little bit about the the showing the craft and and the decision of how much of um, Steve's work you decided to include in the film and what it was like to shoot these images of him creating these vessels um, and then of course at the, the, your choice at the end of the film to show these individual pieces on the in the credits I think. Um, it's very moving to see them alongside the numbers. Um, so can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. I mean, I think there is a real beauty to what Steve does in terms of his pottery. And um, I think part of it is it was a little bit um, in an attempt to offset some of the sadness that obviously comes through with his story. And so people who are attracted to art or who understand art, or even those who don't, are able to kind of look at the pottery and see sort of 
the mesmerizing way of working with Clay and, and hearing Steve's story as it relates to Clay. I mean, he said it was sort of a, a personal thing for him and it gave him a reason to get up when it was so difficult. And so I think that um, showing him in different ways with Clay was really important in terms of the glazing and the different aspects. So I think that was very much a purposeful thing. And I think at the end, I mean, I have to give credit to my editor, Rachel Clark, who really did a phenomenal job in putting it all together. I mean, we worked as a team, but I really have to give her the credit for, for all the amazing work that she did. And I don't remember whose idea it was, but we sort of came up with the idea of there would be the, the Kaddish uh, Chawan at the end to some of the, the major people in the film. And I think it was beautiful because it's hard to see it close up, but Steve had taken all these photos of it. And so that way people could really see the finished product um, and its beauty and sort of a, a, well, I guess it's one dimensional in terms of the screen, but to really appreciate the work that he created. You know, I'll, I'll Steve, add, so. I, yeah. Go yeah. Ahead. Uh, in in a broader sense, um, you know, while while the making of my Kaddish Chawans, as I as I express in the film, was a was a, a daily, individual, unique, and solitary experience, where they did not, where one did not flow into the other. It it wasn't chronological like that as I was doing them. Although obviously it was one one after the other after the other after the other, but. But in a broader sense, one of the things that I talk to my students about often is that artists communicate through their media. And it's a language that we speak and it becomes part of your lexicon and, and part of your, it becomes a lifestyle. And I was speaking not only to myself, but I was speaking to whoever was ever going to see these Chawans. Mm -hmm. In, in a language that is as certain as speaking English or Hebrew or Spanish or Chinese. So when we talk about the craft of making these objects, it's, it's more than just the making of a single object. It's, it, it's a word or a phrase or an essay or a, or a book, it's, it's a language. I'm curious, um, thinking about that in terms of the, ch I'll say, it sort of seems like there may be chapters in there because as much as you say they don't speak to each other, there's, at the exhibit, you say these were the eight days of Hanukkah. Um, and I wonder if there's some sort of cohesion between some of the works. Um, and also, I'm, I'm curious how, you know, you said you'd never made a Chawan the first day you did, and you made it obviously in, in Jared's memory because that was his practice. Um, if your relationship to the object changed over the course of the 365 days? My, my relation to the Chawan changed when I made the first one, day one. And, and also, as I explain in the film, as I express in the film, uh, I, I had never, I had made tea bowls before and I'd made all kinds of bowls. I'd made hundreds, thousands of bowls in my career up to that point. But the Chawan, is a unique object. It's, a, it's an object that's, that's tied to a specific, specific history, a specific culture, a specific practice, a specific ritual. And unless you are familiar with those aspects that make up the Chawan, it would be almost disrespectful to call, or it would be disrespectful to call an object that you made a Chawan. You know, you can make, any potter can make a bowl and call it an ice cream bowl or a soup bowl you know, or even a bowl for chili or for onion soup. But to make a chawan requires a, a knowledge of its origin and its history. And people will sometimes say, oh, Steve, you make Japanese, you, you make Japanese chawans. I say, no, I don't make Japanese chawans. I'm not Japanese. I make Japanese style chawans. So there, that's part of understanding what this object is and how me as, a, as an American can make this form that is, that is uh, Japanese in origin. And were there things that, tie, that created chapters yes, in these? Th there were, but, but not necessarily um, 
conscious as I was making them. Yes, the eight days of Hanukkah, you know, I knew it was Hanukkah. I was, I was making them. And I knew that, you know, that was, that was kind of a snapshot because of the way we would always celebrate Hanukkah. You know, the way we would celebrate Hanukkah with, with Jared and Adam is light our candles each night, say, say the Hanukkah prayers, sing some songs, and they would get a small gift every night. So, you know, there was the eight days of Hanukkah, you know, just like the days that make up Passover, you know, that was, that was a practice in our house. So those shawans that I made during Passover of that year can be considered a chapter. And then in looking back over them and in me surveying them, uh, I could see connections and see relationships between each, not, not all of the bowls, but between some of them. Uh, the first one, the one that I made during uh, on Jared's birthday, and the last one. These are these are three significant milestone chawans that, in some ways, tied the whole 365 chawans together. Um, I I want to go back to something you said earlier, and and sort of put, move into talking about that with uh, Miriam and Randy because the idea of knowledge of the history of the craft um, is so essential also to the work that Rabbi Kevin Hale does um, in as a sofer, as a scribe. Um, and I was I was really interested not just in the actual practice of, of writing the letters, but the tools that he uses. Um, how much of that did you learn while making the film? And can you talk a little bit about getting to know those objects through his eyes? I didn't know any of it. And I have to give credit to Randy because um, at our first shoot, she said, I want to lay out all the tools and have him explain them. It wasn't on my schedule. And I said, OK. <laughs> and I had no idea what we were going to do with it. And then that was actually the first sequence that we edited. And, uh, and people have really enjoyed learning all those things. Yeah, Randy, yeah. what made I, you do that? Well, I love that you remember these kinds of things that I don't. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it was so fascinating to see them. And I think that, you know, Kevin is just so, so generous and wants to really teach and impart all of his, you know, knowledge, um, which you know, is in such a wide area from the most traditional that's been passed down to his own, you know, um, unique interpretations of things. So I think, you know, also just really following kind of his lead of how he teaches and um, just trying to really pick up, you know, with the camera, what he, what he was teaching to the students that day. Um, yeah, and, and we learned, I think, so much and and part of the frustration of course of editing was deciding what to what to keep and what to not um so there's a lot of more you know wonderful stories about the objects and the tools and especially his teacher uh you know I learned a lot about how special that relationship was with his teacher Dr. Eric Ray who um yeah comes from a long tradition as well so I think yeah he Miriam mentioned and I that both, yeah well, he mentioned that his teacher is the one who has the tradition of using the silver needle, which um, I thought was a really beautiful yeah. tradition of not wanting to use any metals that can be uh, used to make weapons. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I think that also, um, I think we think of the Torah as maybe a, a stagnant object in that it's been the same words for all of these years. And the close-up you do on the shots of the text where the writing is different. Um, mm. So taking these traditions and making them your own, can, the choice to include the text and him writing the text um, and these close-ups are beautiful. Um, were you shooting him immediately? Did you have this idea of integrating these, these other um, scripts into the film from the get-go? Uh, you know, I. I always knew that I wanted the first thing to be a real close-up of him writing a letter. That was just what was always in my mind. And then we got lucky because the three different Torahs that we filmed him restoring had such different scripts. And when we realized that, we decided to, 
to make that a feature to, to juxtapose them, which I think must also be something that's a big challenge for people who are reading Torah. I mean, if you walk up to a new Torah and you haven't seen that script before, I think it must be really disorienting. <laughs> so, uh, and of course, it says that pearls are who the. You're breaking up a little bit, Miriam. Yeah. They're, they're, I'll take over then. <laughs> Well, I'd, I'd like to add something, you know, as an artist and as a craftsperson, the, I, was, I was really drawn into his tools, especially when he was making the quills and the close-ups of him using the tools and, um, and, and scribing, and I'll just say drawing the letters was very similar to the way a sumi, a Japanese sumi artist uses a sumi brush to, to draw. And uh, in, in Japanese, there's, I don't even think there's a word for writing. The word that's used is drawing. They draw their letters. And just like, just like he was doing when he was scribing the Torah. And I was just drawn in and fascinated watching him leaning over the Torah. And, his, and while he was painstakingly doing it, it was fluid. It was just, it was just flowing from from his mind to his arm to his fingers to the quill, you know, and the ink flowing off onto the parchment. It was it was just wonderful to see. It's really beautiful to watch. Um, I, I'll also I want to mention that uh, Rabbi Kevin Hale is going to be teaching, uh, giving a free demonstration to our audience on Friday afternoon, um, and we'll teach how to write a uh, Shabbat Shalom in traditional script and you can register for that on our website. Um, so I hope you'll join him for that uh, this Friday. And last but not least, I do want to talk about the craft in uh, Fatima Morgana and it's so beautifully animated. I'm wondering if both of you are animators, if it was a collaborative process and um, I have several questions, but I, I think there was these scenes that it looked like they were almost on the moon. I think the the landscapes you you created are are so stunning and really um, reflect a lot of what you were saying through the words uh, through the interviews. Can you talk a little bit about animating this documentary? Um, we both uh, studied animation in uh, Bezalel Academy of Art. And it was uh, our basic training, <laughs> I can say. And we both are very, very attracted to animated documentaries. Uh, I mean, uh, personally, I saw Aris Fallman film was with Bashir in the cinemas and it really uh, like blew my mind that animation can be for adults and have uh, conversations about adult things and war and very dark stuff. <laughs> And uh, it became something very interesting to me to use this tool of animation to, to make some kind of different way of documentary. And so uh, Liana is a very big fan of uh, documentary as well. And we both have different uh, likes. I mean, I, I do love to make uh, figures and uh, animate them. And Liana is very a uh, professional in backgrounds. So we split the word, so, uh, the work uh, between us, something like she was uh, in, the, in, in, in the head of being the layout artist and the background artist and I was uh, behind the figures animation and their concept art and to make some kind of uh, unique way to describe these girls we saw in real life, uh, but have them some kind of uh, animated uh, heroine inside the movie itself. And it was a very, very hard work for us to think how to make the documentary not just used in the voices of the girls, but also be reflected in the art and in the backgrounds. And uh, I think Liana will be <laughs> the perfect to speak about the backgrounds themselves. She was the master of it. <laughs> uh, we wanted to use uh, video and animation. Uh, we thought from the beginning that 
uh, using footage and using video is more reflecting. Like when you saw a video or footage, you immediately thinking uh, of it as a memory. And when you looking at animation, it's kind of connecting to imagination. And one of the first thing that we understand um, after we talked with the girls it's how it's not just a romantic thing to go and uh, be a nomad and there is a life and society's expectations and we have our memories and what driving us so we decided to build a concept art that based also on animation both animation and uh, footage and we used footage uh, that is originally from, from, for example, Christina's uh, living room. It's actually uh, her parents' living room, and we we took, uh, you know, the, the 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 sofa and the TV, and uh, put it in the in the mountains to reflect their thinking, and that was one of the the first uh, art decisions that we that we took. Very important to us to make a very surrealistic uh, kind of feeling. Uh, it, it it's some kind of hybrid between reality and uh, and art art place, and some somehow the combination of the both make this place look a bit as you said like a moon or a place that is doesn't exist, but it's it actually uh, make make us wonder. Uh, when they're going uh, to their trips and having this very utopic life and choosing their way of life, uh, they always struggle in the conflictities that their way of life uh, make, make them feel. So it was a very interesting way to combine them and make this very strange uh, 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 environment uh, look like. But we, we thought that maybe the viewer will be thinking about uh, the difficulties that the character have by seeing those weird scenes, by seeing this very interesting, unrealistic mountain that built from uh, part of footage and part of uh, lines and part of uh, painting uh, crafts inside uh, and make the conflict more occur all the time. It's, it's interesting, I, thinking about it, you know, it's on these surreal, you know, moon lake or whatever we want to call it, uh, backgrounds, we, the objects that are there, you see a, a teapot or these, you know, they're, they're, these are women who have chosen not to have these maybe uh, material connections, but, but that's what's sort of giving us the ties um, to what we know as reality. Um, and I think uh, many of these films, I think, A Father's Cottage and Commandment 613 also deal with sort of objects as connection, um, the Torah uh, being a connection through both place and time, um, the Chawan connecting, of course, to Jared's memory um, and marking time. So um, there's something very, very nice that draws these films together. Um, I, I, there, I wanted to ask, we're going to move to questions from the audience in a minute. Um, I wanted to talk about in Commandment 613, you talk about this uh, Torah project of restoring the Torahs. Um, how, how large, is that an ongoing project? Um, how long has Kevin been attached to it? And, and how did you learn about it? Uh, I think Kevin's been doing this for about 10 or 15 years. I'm afraid I don't know that. Kevin's watching, so he's he's probably shouting the answer at us. And <laughs> Tell us in the chat if we're wrong. <laughs> uh, the Torahs came to London in 1964, and they were many of them were restored then over several years before they were sent out to communities around the world on sort of per permanent loan. Uh, but they are old. They're hundreds of years old, and they need attention. Uh, either there's an accident and the Torah rips, as was the case with the, uh, the Torah at Wesley Enhanced Living, or they were uh, sent out in a condition that was not kosher, uh, but were intended to be used for display and remembrance. And the community calls in someone like Kevin and says, can it be made kosher? And he figures out if it can or not. 
So there's always restoration, always restoration to be done on these scrolls. He works on other scrolls, but I think he does a lot of his work on these uh, scrolls from Czechoslovakia. There are about a thousand in the U.S. out of the wow. original 1,564. Um, and there's a question in the audience about um, the father's group that Steve is a part of. Um, Jen, did, was it, were you immediately allowed to film there? And, and then I also want to ask Steve if um, your project, your Kaddish craft project, if that, or crafting your, through Kaddish um, has inspired uh, people to take up similar practices. Uh, but I'll start with you, Jen. Um, so we, you know, Steve and I had started to build a relationship and um, when he mentioned the Fathers Forever group, I think in our first interview, I definitely wanted to see if there was a way that we could film just to get a better insight into something, you know, any way that we could to try to find out what was some of the methodologies that Steve used in his own healing process. So I think as was mentioned before, it was really um, a gift that the men were open to us filming and, and a credit to Steve and his relationship with the men that they would allow us to be there. And, um, you know, what made it into the film was such a tiny, tiny percentage. I think we filmed for an hour there. I spent about 55 minutes crying myself around the corner because I didn't want to get in the way of the, the filming. And it was just an, a really incredible experience to be witness to the kind of devotion that they have to each other and to the topic. And so I think as Steve mentioned before, it was something that was organic. We talked about it, he talked to the men and then we were able to make a date and they were fantastic. And I just said, you know, thank you so much and please ignore us and continue on your way. And, and we got some incredible things. So it was really a gift to, to us and to the film. Steve, you're, you're muted. There we go. Better? Yes. Um, when I mentioned it to the, to the men, um, there was no hesitation, really. Um, whereas uh, we never allow other, I mean, we've never been asked really formally, but we've, ne we've never allowed anybody else to, to join us for, for any of our get-togethers, any of our breakfasts. Uh, when I mentioned this to the men, uh, there was no hesitation at all because they knew what they knew about the film being in production. I had talked about it. They knew it was happening. And, and uh, I, I think one of the reasons that there was no hesitation goes back to one of the, one of the key elements uh, that I talk about in the film about our children is the fear that the common theme that the, we, we fear that the memory of our children will be forgotten. And this was another way, and I'm gonna get emotional right now. Having Jen and Nikki there uh, to witness a get together of ours and to hear us talk about our children was another way for all of our children to to be shared in, an, in another venue, you know, for the future, another way for our children not to be forgotten. So, so that was, that was a way, that was, I think the, the primary reason why there was no hesitation to allow them to come in and, and, uh, and film us. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think that hearing, hearing the other stories, um, hearing the other fathers speak, um, definitely um, added to the added to the collective memory of, of all of the children of Jared, but also um, it was a very it was a really powerful moment in the film, and um, and I don't think we get to see that that often. We don't see um, men speaking in that way publicly, um, and and I think it it's a very meaningful thing to see on film, and I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah, and the other thing I would just want to share quickly about the Fathers Forever group is that it's not a therapy group. And when I describe it to people, um, I, I'll always include the, the, the explanation that if you were a fly on the wall for 10 minutes of, of uh, a given part of our, uh, of, of our get together, 
and you listen to us, you might not even know what brings us together because it's not a bereavement group. It's not a grief group. It's not a therapy group. It's a group of men who share the common bond of having had children that have passed away. And we talk about how we're living. And that's the unique, the a unique quality uh, of Fathers Forever. And the group is still meeting. That was actually the oh, yeah. question here. Yeah. Every yeah. month. Yeah. Every month. Yeah. Um, there's a question in the audience to the Fato Morgana team about the title of the film. Um, and I actually, I, I think that the, you, you all have chosen such incredible titles for, for your film. So maybe we can turn it into a larger question. Um, but the question here is, what does the title mean and how do the women who travel and live nomadic lives support themselves? So it's a two part question. Uh, we'll start with the, first, with the second part of the question. How do these women support themselves financially? Well, uh, it's 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 a very tough one. Uh, it was interesting because we, I think, when we started uh, to talk about uh, Fata Morgana with the girls, and I mean, when we just started the film, we didn't even like thought about the financial thing. We just uh, thought we are fascinated by the subject of uh, female nomads that go by themselves. Uh, some of them were traveling for years and we somehow didn't even thought about it by uh, ourselves that, oh, well, it's a very tough thing to do. I mean, financially to do it. And uh, the girls actually were the, the main motivation to even mention this thing. And they, they have speak about it a lot. I mean, uh, Christina mentioned that uh, she think that she couldn't do it without the home she was grown up in. And uh, Anna just uh, mentioned it as something that is so uh, like inside her since childhood that it wasn't like even a question. And Rachel is, uh, is uh, Rachel, when we speak with her, she was very busy about this thing of uh, financially how to do it. She is doing most of her traveling by uh, getting some tramps to uh, very distant places, and uh, and sometimes she leaves. Uh, she finds like people on the way that helps her. Uh, she is a very interesting woman. A lot of people are very attracted to her and want to see what uh, she has to say. And usually there are some people on the road that helps her. Uh, and they are like helping her with food uh, in, when she was in the cave, uh, which is one of the stories in the film. Uh, sometimes her family came to visit and uh, brought uh, things with her. Uh, so basically each one of them uh, having struggles with that, but they somehow mentioned, uh, managed to do it. They just, just, just keep doing it and it, it, like, <laughs> it just happened. So. Uh, I'm not sure that it's a way of life that everyone can afford. Uh, sometimes uh, you need to live in a very, very minimalistic way and be very trusting in people and believe that they will help you in time of need. Uh, but it's something that very that is very characteristic to our figures. They are not afraid from it and they know that they can manage it. So. Uh, are they traveling now that there's all these limitations on travel? Where are they? Where are they quarantining, or where are they staying during this time? Well, now they're pretty settled down, <laughs> uh, which was a funny thing to do. I mean, uh, some of them are moving in the the boundaries of of uh, their countries. Uh, but it's a very settled uh, time for them as well. Uh, not sure that it's their will, but it's definitely make them to be more settled. Um, also, Christina, it, it's like it's it's a long journey, so they do walk along along the way. Rachel talked uh, talk with us about different walks that she that she did. And uh, Anna, she's an arts teacher, and Christina, she's a travel writing, and uh, Rachel is in inviting, uh, in, she has a lot of um, kind of, uh, how do you say it in English? It's like uh, she invites, uh, invents things. She, she, in order to live in a cave, she, um, she kind of develops 
uh, a solar system that will help her uh, uh, using a print and computer in the cave. Uh, so there, wow. as Daniela said, they are managing it and there are, because it, it's a long journey, so they have like situation that they are settling down for two years here, uh, one year over there. So it's, uh, it's changing. <laughs> What, what, and what does the title Fata Morgana mean? Okay, so about the uh, title uh, is a mirage. It's kind of a phenomenon. Uh, you can see it in, uh, when you imagine water or if you see like ships and in, in, the, in the sea. And we thought that it will be... Um, Kind of a metaphor for all this um, imaginary stuff that uh, you see in the in the movie and in the and in the, in the object like they're inside the thought in their in their journeys. It reflects their willings and conflicts, and I mean uh, the places. It looks real, but it's not, and sometimes. Uh -huh. Their willing is so breakable, and they just want to go uh, to the road. And uh, the, we are not sure if the objects are uh, the objects are there or not. Uh, what is that reflect? So we thought it's some kind of a Fata Morgana, Morgana we created ourselves uh, in the film itself, and it will be a represent representation <laughs> of uh, their souls and needs and the conflicts in the movie. Mm. Beautiful. Uh, there's a question here for Jen. Um, and the question is, it was an amazing film, but hard to watch. I imagine it was also hard to make. The question is, what was the hardest part of this project um, and getting started the subject itself? Um, hmm, that's a very good question. The hardest part of the film, I, I think, was having a balance between um, the sadness of Steve's loss and and what that meant to him in the process, but also showing that sort of trying to be a role model to other people in terms of options to give them for losses that they've had. And I think the rabbi talks about, you know, reading or um, praying or writing in a journal or something like that. And Steve, of course, chose uh, pottery, which is his uh, trade. But I think it was to try to give hope to people that there are ways um, to kind of get through this. We all have losses. I mean, you just sort of don't get out of this world without having a loss. Um, and I think we really wanted to convey hope and also convey a real person's story and how they manage. So, you know, I think the hard part was feeling all those emotions. Um, I spent a lot of time crying, to be honest. I mean, it was just, it was very emotional. Steve is a very emotional guy and the story was um, very intense. So I think that was a hard part um, to sort of get through it, uh, not comparing at all with what Steve and Ellen had to go through and Adam, um, but just really feeling all those feelings. Steve, what was the hardest part for you in having your story filmed? Or maybe in watching the film, what, what was it like for you to see to see your story on film? Um, from from the beginning of the production, uh, Jen had uh, asked me to to uh, to watch it, you know, to kind of um, see how it was going for some. Uh, if I wanted to have some creative input. Uh, and from the start, I knew that I did not want to see the film until it debuted and, uh, and everybody else was going to see it. I wanted, to, I, I wanted it to be fresh for me as it is for everybody else. Um, and Jen respected that. And I told her that uh, you are the filmmaker, you're the artist, I'm the subject. I don't want to have any creative input. You know, I'm not asking you to to to, uh, to tell me how to make my pots, and I'm not going to ask. I'm not going to tell you how to make your films. And it was out of respect from one artist to another, and and we respected each other. Finally, last spring, when it was very near completion, Jen called me and said, "Steve, 
I've respected this, your decision not to want to see the film, and I understand, but you have to see the, the, the rough cut now. And you have to see it to see if there's anything in there that is inaccurate, that there's anything that um, that's not there, that you want to be there in there, that's anything that's in there that you don't want to be in. You have to see it now. It's very important. So I just, you know, I sucked it up and I sat and I watched it and um, I, I needed windshield wipers across my eyes uh, and and I gave her my input and then I just kind of put it out of my mind until I saw it um, debut. And uh, it, was, it was very emotional, very, not hard to watch. That's not the accurate way to put it because I, I really couldn't wait to watch it, but it was, it was difficult. It was, it was very difficult to relive, not just the making of the Chawans and what went into that and, and what spawned the film and my visit to Alfred and my memories of Jared, but, uh, but just everything about it. It was very difficult to watch, but I couldn't not watch it. And I will watch it again and again and again. It's not going to be any easier every time I watch it, but how can I not be drawn to it? And how could, how could Ellen not be drawn to it? So, yes, I, I want to just loop in another question that we are getting for you here about um, the challenge because I, I think it relates to this um, because the film, of course, is um, holds this memory. But um, the question is if, if each individual Chawan does too, and if you can remember what you're you were thinking when creating it when you look at the that, when you look at the <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a really really great question, and. Um, the short answer is no. I, I don't remember making each one. There are some that I do remember, as I stated earlier, the first one, the last one, the one I made on Jared's um, birthday. But, um, and I remember being in the studio and I have various images of me being there, but they, they are, the images are a combination of, of fact and fiction of what I've made up in my mind and what I remember in my mind. And I think that goes, that speaks to the individual standalone, solitary making of each Chawan each day. And, you know, yes, I do remember, but, but I don't remember making each one. And the added difficulty here, the added complication, not difficulty, but complication is that I didn't, I didn't glaze them and, and fire them until the 10th year after I had made them. So the, it, it's almost like two different uh, creative acts, the making of them and the emotion that went into each one when I made them, and then a whole different set of emotions and observations and, and, a, and, and a life, a completely different life, which, is, which was 10 years after the fact. So. It's there's there's something interesting in sort of the practice there of waiting the 10 years in the same way in the film you visit um, the storage unit where you had Jared's things and it's all these these processes of of saying goodbye and I and I think there's again I think there's some really interesting um, parallels between a father's cottage and commandment 613 and you know this the Torah scrolls of course are um, it's a it's a practice of cre of creating or recreating a Torah scroll in a way um, every time uh, it's Kevin puts a, the final letter on a restoration um, he gives it a new life and inevitably we know that in another few decades or a century that this is going to happen again to that same scroll. Um, I'm I'm curious, you know, Steve spoke about giving Jen creative control there. Did did, did Kevin see the film while you were working on it? Um, was he involved at all in the creation of the project? I would love to get Steve and Kevin together because I think they had very similar experiences, uh, which was they trusted us. And Kevin was very reluctant to watch, even though we really wanted him to watch at certain points to say, did we get this right? Is there something you don't want shown? Uh, things like that. So, but I'd love to get them together to like do their craft thing too and trade tools and teach each other what they do. I think that that's another film. 
I would love that. Well, you're both in Massachusetts, so so this can happen. (laughs) I also just want to say that Kevin always talks about the sort of his decision to, you know, be the best uh, documentary subject and 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 allow us to do our our thing and also to show a lot of respect for our craft, which he at times also referred to as doing Torah, that what we were doing was that. So, I mean, as a rabbi and a teacher, I felt like um, he was really giving us, I mean, he was giving us many different options of the types of things that we might want to choose to put in the film, but he was also sort of giving us the universe to choose from. Um, very consciously and with a lot of respect, I think, as as an artist, as fellow artists. So it's nice. It's nice to hear that um, that parallel. Yeah. There, there's a question here for you, Omer, also about working uh, with. It's, it's a different story, of course, as as actors. But how did how did you cast these kids? Who the comment uh, the question mentions how wonderful they were, and and um, this is you know. That one, I, you, this is an early film for you, and they always say, you know, don't work with kids or animals. So, so what was the experience uh, directing these these kids who were really phenomenal in the film? Right. No, I love. I definitely heard the warning of don't work with kids. Um, but I, I love working with kids. I think they're they're you know any direction you give them, it's like a challenge. So it's like a, a game, which a big part of acting is. But if like I would tell Ty, you know make her laugh so he would just not give up until he made the other (laughs) actress laugh or you know so for me it was about like finding kind of finding games to to play with him you know like uh okay don't don't make her look away make her look just like actions that you can give him uh but the kids were we cast them with our casting director uh natalie and carla um who worked together and they did such a great job. I think the, I think the real key is just to be open. We saw many different ages and ethnicities, and we're very open to just, you know, finding real personalities. And really, I think our goal was to find the, the real kids, who usually get cast in the background and don't get <laughs> these auditions because they, they that's what they bring. You know, is the real accent, the real. Um, feeling that they're usually not seen. Yeah, uh, they, they they were really fantastic. Um, are they still acting? I don't know. I don't, I mean, Lior, Lior uh, the, the kid who plays Itai, this was his first acting thing ever. Every, every time I say this, people are like really surprised in a live audience, you like, oh my God. Um, <laughs> I think it's kind of, but yeah, but also I think that was a huge advantage for him because he came into it like not really, you know, just really open to the experience. So it's his first thing acting. I don't know if he's acted since. The other two kids, yeah, they are still acting. And 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 actually the real challenge, I think, was actually finding Israeli actors in LA. That was a hard thing too, because usually people ask about the kids, but like finding a grandmother who's fluent in Hebrew, that's an actress in LA, was really hard to find. And, and I'm so lucky we found Rita. She's, she's, she was phenomenal and really great to work with. She plays the grandmother. And uh, yeah, we got really lucky. She was wonderful. I, I'm also curious about the teacher. You said this is vaguely based on your own experience. Um, was that based on somebody, or at least the way you remember your teacher in Texas? And uh, would you ever send them the film? <laughs> uh, definitely based on my drama teacher in Texas. You know, it is my memory, so I don't know. I was I was eleven, but all I remember is you know you can't get the lead until you fix your accent. And I remember it, you know, because like now I have much less of an Israeli accent because I worked so hard to make it not be heard so I could get the lead and I didn't get the lead ever but (laughs) but but I ended up dancing and that was like not the accent didn't matter in dancing so that was the alternative one day you can cast yourself in your own film so (laughs) Uh, there's there's a really nice question here about um 
the role of art in helping us maintain a sense of equilibrium and love um, in these times, you know, where, where people are experiencing a lot of hate and uh, nationalism. And I think people have been really suffering, um, being isolated in their homes. Um, and I, I think it's a question both for all of you as filmmakers and for you as a potter, um, what are the messages you hope to spread with your film and with your art? Anyone can jump in on this one. Steve, your, your mic is <laughs> off, so why don't you start? <laughs> Do you, well, I mean, do you, well, you, you waited 10 years to exhibit, to exhibit your Chawans, and I'm curious, there's also been questions in here about where to buy, buy your pottery. So okay. um, do you generally exhibit and, and is it always such a personal project or do you ever do it with an audience in mind? Uh, you mean making the work with an audience in mind? Yeah. Um, very early in my career, and, I, and, I, and I'll make this very short and sweet, very early in my career, I made the decision that I would not make pots to sell. I would sell the pots that I made. And that, that was a, an epiphany of freedom to, to speak through my work. And you know, if somebody was able to connect with something and they wanted to, to buy it, you know, that, that was great. And related to that, uh, I'm always asked the question when I'm doing workshops and demonstrations, when, when do you know when your work is finished? And when people ask me that question, they're asking aesthetically and, and, and technically, you know, when do you know, when do you know when to stop? And I turn the question, the question eventually comes back to me after I pose the question to everybody in the, in the class, and my answer to that is my work is completed when it's in the possession of somebody else. Mm. So uh, I make work, my, all my work is for sale, but I don't make work to sell. I sell the work that I make. And I speak through my work. As I said before, it's a language and it's the way I express myself. You know, if, if I felt that I would be able to express myself better through the written word, you know, maybe I would be a poet or a playwright or an essayist or a novelist, but I'm a clay artist and, and that's what I do. So that's, that's will what you, Will you share your website or uh, wherever people can, can see your work if they are interested in, in buying sure. it? We'll share sure. that here. Should I put um, it? If you want to put that in. Sure, put it in the chat if you can. I'll and, and I'll ask you next, Randy and Miriam, uh, who, well, let, if Jen, if you want to add anything to sort of making the film about Steve and then, um, uh, who, what you hope to sort of convey and, and who you hope it reaches and, and where it's going next also, we'll sort of throw all that in, in one here. Uh, well, you know, thank you for asking. Thank you for doing such a great job with this. I, I think that, um, as, I, as I mentioned before, I really hope this is a vehicle for hope for other people who have struggled. Um, and whether it's a, a loss from COVID, it doesn't have to be a loss from losing a child, which is which is devastating, but any kind of loss that people have in their life um, and that there's a way to try and help them move, um, I guess Steve says not move through it, move, incorporate it into your life, but try to, to get through that particular difficult part or the most difficult part um, that people can. And my hope is that it will be you know, seen broadly. We, we are applying to festivals all over the world and um, I'm waiting impatiently to hear about some other ones. So I don't have anything to report at the moment, but my, my, my hope is that the film does provide hope for people. Is there anywhere people can follow the film? Um, yes. So that if they wanted to tell friends in other places and yep. keep an eye on, on it. Our, on our website and I'll put that in the chat. Thank you. Great. And um, Miriam yeah. and Randy, I'd love to hear from you about, I mean, this is also a very, a, a deeply Jewish film, but I think there's a, a message for, for the world there. And I'm curious sort of what your, um, what your goal is in terms of getting the film out to the world and um, what you hope to convey as well. Well, maybe, can I say one thing and then Miriam can yeah. talk about the, the distribution. Um, I, I really um, appreciated how, um, Kevin and uh, Jeffrey from the Memorial Scrolls Trust also talked about Torah as the foundation of the Christian and Muslim uh, spiritual texts as well. And it was really important for me, I sort of really wanted to make sure that that stayed in the film because 
um, you know, this is a, is a Jewish story, but I really felt that it was important to make it something that could speak to people who are not Jewish and, um, you know, that, that it sort of talks about the, the really specific Jewish history and relationship to the text, but that it, that it goes beyond that. And um, yeah, I'm not sure I'm saying it well because it's late again in Amsterdam, <laughs> but Miriam <laughs> can talk about, uh, yeah, the distribution and, and also um, we've had a really yeah, nice time with that. Well, yeah. we've um, uh, oddly, the current state of the world has allowed us to do distribution in a way that we never would have expected, which is that we do screenings, private online screenings for synagogues and other groups. And it gives people a way to gather around a topic that has great significance for them and to have very honest conversations about it in a way that might not be possible in person. Uh, and if I were traveling to, you know, try to go to four different synagogues on Simchat Torah and do screenings, it just wouldn't work. Um, and Kevin wouldn't be able to be at all of them also. And this way we get to have conversations and hear what people think and how they connect to these particular scrolls and to Torah in general. Um, and it's been very moving for us to, to hear the different reactions that people have. People connect to Torah, they connect to Kevin's own spiritual journey. Uh, they connect to the, the history of these particular scrolls. So I, I hate to say this, but we're having a great time <laughs> meeting so many people. Um, and if anybody watching this who's seen it as part of the festival would like to arrange for a screening for their own synagogue or club or study group, really happy to do that. And you can email me. <laughs> I'll put my email address in the chat. Great, great. And, and of course, all of these films are available until November 15th uh, with the festival and also Kevin will be, uh, Rabbi Kevin Hale will be joining us next Friday for the calligraphy. Um, moving, moving down the line, uh, Daniela and Liana, do you wanna share a little bit about where the film is going and, um, and what you hope people are, are getting out of it? Or what you're working on next, whatever you wanna share. <laughs> so everyone, everyone is very right. It's a very, very strange uh, time to distribute your film. <laughs> Uh, I mean, this month uh, the film is screening in eight countries, and a month before in five, and it like travels all around the world. But we <laughs> we finished to see it in our private home in like some kind of online platforms, and it's I mean it's very exciting because we do feel that we are connected to people through that and. The subject feels more relevant than ever because of the difference of what these girls are doing and what we are doing during these times. Uh, but uh, we laughed about it a lot because when we worked so hard about the film and it was two years of making this uh, 11 minutes, uh, we used to, to tell each other, well, when we finish the movie, hopefully we will uh, manage to get even to some kind of small festival and go to a nice trip and meet new people and go to travel ourselves <laughs> like those girls. We were very envy with them uh, while we are animating that this is their way of life. And <laughs> the COVID a little bit like destroyed all, <laughs> all these plannings. Uh, but uh, we do feel that in some kind of weird way, because it became so relevant, people are even more connected to these girls and somehow get more excited and touched by their stories. They feel uh, because of the situation that they are trapped in their home and between our four, four walls, uh, it's more inspiring to see those girls going and it's some kind of, I don't know, maybe wishful, wishful thinking of what to do <laughs> after we will finish all this time period, hopefully so. And also it's our it's Fata like... Morgana. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Ariana, can I add one thing uh, uh, about something you said earlier? Um, you, you used the phrase, I waited for 10 years before I finished the Chawans. It, it, it's a misunderstanding. I didn't wait. It's not like I went into the studio every day, looked at them and said, uh, no, I'm going to wait another day or I'm going to wait another month or I'm going to wait another year. I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait. It was 
it was organic. I went into the studio and one day I looked at them. And as I said in the film, they spoke to me and they said, now is the time. It's the time. So it wasn't a matter of waiting. It was a matter of being, realizing that the time had come. And I think that's reflected also in, in you know, I, I saw the parallel with opening up the storage unit and you, you spoke about revisiting the campus in the same, in the same way. Uh, Liana, you were gonna add something to, to the uh, story of what's yeah. next for the film. <laughs> Yeah, you asked like what motivated us to, to make the film and we really want to show like women in the nomad role. Uh, we, we saw, we, we always hear about like male that goes in the, in the culture and in the, uh, in the literature and all the stories that we, we know is based on a male character. So if uh, there is something that uh, we wanted to say is that uh, women also can make their like self-searching journey and missionary uh, purpose, and uh, this is the uh, this is the reason that we choose realistic stories and try to bring all the uh, the, the old picture. And I think it's uh, it, it really what we wanted to say through the. It's a beautiful thought. I think you, I'm thinking of Odysseus, you know, if, if he'd stayed home and worked on those, on those tapestries and Penelope had gone on, on the road, those aren't, we don't see that often. So your film really brings those, those stories into like light. To the wild alchemist, the, there are many, plenty of uh, examples for exactly that. Usually we yeah. used to see a woman inside the house, like waving her knife or something and wait for a man to come back and we wanted to make some kind of change to see uh, a woman goes to her road and not sure where we we'll be ending, if it will be ending and not to judge them for doing that uh, as women. I mean, to see what it costs, what it costs from those uh, people who choose to do it, but not to judge them based on their genders and what we used to see in the culture. And Omer, your story also, if you can just tell us a little bit about, um, obviously your film also takes takes us, um, it's somebody who's who's gone away from home, obviously with a much less um, positive experience in a way, but um, what was the story you were hoping to tell? And then also, I, I, my question for you is, this is a film that somebody has said to me, they hope would see it as a feature. Uh, what are you working on next? Have you thought about developing this character into a, a longer film? Uh, oh, I got a message. The host has spotlighted. Oh. Yes, you've been, you're spotlighted. Okay, later. Okay. Um, so the question, yes. Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, we're, we're definitely thinking of, of making it into a TV show, actually. I mean, it, it could be a future, but I think a cool thing about a TV show is kind of getting into the other, the other two trees home life mm -hmm. and what was the the, the first the first part of the question well I think that's what you sort of spoke earlier about you know why you made this film so um I guess where where the this film is going next and um and then beyond the tv show if, if you're showing at other festivals if you want people to follow you anywhere that's yeah we're we're playing at more virtual festivals our website is a uh, tree number three film.com so we have all the updates uh there and uh yeah and the message i think it, yeah it's what, what kind of what i mentioned before but it's to not let other people uh define you and you know if you're cast as tree number three it could be a really you could make it a really great role so i love that it's number three i, I mean I, we didn't get to talk unfortunately we have to wrap up and i would have loved to talk about all of your titles i think a father's cottage is, is such an expressive title of what the film is and commandment 613 I, I you know it, it, it's also a debt you know I didn't I think it says so much in, in just these short phrases and tree number three I think number three you know it, it's not tree number one <laughs> so um thank you all for joining us I, I could talk to you for hours I I really um 
th I, I love all of your films so much and I don't know if you're seeing all the comments coming in in the chat, but um, there's just been so many um, comments about how much all of these films have meant to people and how much they love them all. So thank you all for being here. I know for many of you, it's, the, it's late at night and um, I hope you will continue watching the festival and we look forward to having you join us in the future with whatever you work on next. Thank you. This Have has been night. a lot of fun. Thanks so Thank much. You, Thank, you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Really yeah. nice to see Wonderful everybody's work. festival. Thank you so much for participating. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.